So good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Lisa Dudson, who is a financial advisor with Acumen, which is actually her own business. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Welcome. Hey, now Lisa and I actually met many, many years ago at a one-day training for directors course. Yes, and we did. Yep, we kind of got on with each other a little bit and we sort of mm, vaguely kept in contact, reconnected probably about 10, 12 years ago and have been sort of very um, close friends as well as business acquaintances over that time as well. So Yes, we do. We have some interesting business chats and personal chats while I'll now Walks. Walk, walks and talks. Yeah. Walks and talks are the thing for us. Absolutely. Right. Um, so really happy to have Lisa here today because Lisa has got this wealth of knowledge that she's really um, happy to share with you, both from building a business perspective, but also from how you can actually better manage your money. So tell us a little bit about your journey because a financial advisor, that's what you are now, but that's not where you started, was it? No. And, and I guess I guess the journey did start when, probably when I was 16. And I, um, my father actually gave me a book about the New Zealand share market for my 16th birthday. And so I thought, oh, this sounded like quite a good idea. And I'd always been a bit of a saver because I came from a very blue collar family. And so if you wanted anything, you had to work hard. So I had three yeah. jobs when I was at high school to give you, to put that in perspective. <laughs> wow. And so anyway, so I bought some shares and, and it was in 1986. And for those of you old enough to remember 1987, we had the huge big stock market crash. And so yep. my claim to fame was buying Briley shares at $7 and five cents and selling them for, I think it was 36 or 37 cents. But hey, we learn from our mistakes or, yep. and I used to graph them. I used to get the man or two standard and every Saturday I'd get out and I'd write the prices and I'd graph them and I'd be like, who the hell was like, what that actually achieved? I don't know, but no. what it did is it put it in my headspace. Mm. So I think when I had a I had a big drive to be financially independent because when I grew up, you know, I was from a sort of a family, and my sort of um, friends I went to school with was it was very much about woman went to work for the government in an office, you got married, you know, had two point four kids, the white picket fence, and then you know lived a happy life. And and for me that just was like you know I couldn't cope with the thought of that. <laughs> so therefore, in order to to do okay, then I needed to be financially secure yep. so that set me off on a bit of a journey of you know how do I look after myself financially so I've got freedom of choice and I think I bought my first rental property in about 22 I think yeah um, and so my first career uh, you know I did a degree in business degree in marketing went and lived in London overseas for seven years um, was working in IT and sales and marketing came back to New Zealand in that and interestingly just a chance meeting a friend of mine said what are you doing tonight come around to a friend's mine's house for dinner went around there he worked for AMP uh, looked after all of New Zealand's financial advisors and they had a seminar the next night trying to recruit women into the industry because back then only 3% of the industry were female. Gosh, okay. You know, it seems like a lifetime ago. But yeah. anyway, and so I just kind of thought about it. And I thought, well, that just seems blindingly obvious decision for me. So I literally made a decision overnight to change careers and went and did all my qualifications and uh, worked for a large national company for a year. And then not long after that, um, a year into that, I set up my own business and I've been self-employed um, ever since. So that was in 1999. And you have more than one business that you're involved in, don't you? Yeah, I do. So I kind of, um, I, was st I started Acumen on my own and then about a year into that, I because I was a specialist on the investment advice space, mm -hmm. um, I found a business partner who was specialised in business insurance. And so he came into the business and we built Acumen up um, and then we sold that in 2008 and it was it was interesting, it was 2000, end of 2007 actually, just before the um, GFC and, um, you know, and we built quite a big good sized business. We had 11 staff, which was seen making things small internationally, but in New Zealand and That's financial advice, it's a reasonable size, yeah. yeah. But we just got a bit over it and so... You know, we decided to sell it, and we and what was actually I think this is one of the things I think I feel quite proud of is that we sold it for one of the highest multipliers for sales of that type of business at that time wow. because it was you know we'd started it with systems and processes and it was you know extremely well run. Mm -hmm. um, so we sold that business, and then I scaled Acumen back down to just me. Yep, and that's how I've kept it ever since. But alongside that, um, I also am a director and shareholder of a company called Saturn. And we've got about 27 in our team. Mm -hmm. And so we've got three divisions. One where we do funds under advice for clients, um, then which is investment advice. And then the second division, we do UK pension transfers and sort of locked in work-based super schemes. Yep. And the third one, which is where the, the exciting part of our business is, and that's national capital. And that gives um, key, free KiwiSaver advice and sort of a hybrid robo-advice model and that's a very very exciting part of our business because KiwiSaver in New Zealand is huge yeah. um, and no one hardly anyone's getting any advice yeah, you know so right. it's a big in fact we generally tend to kind of go into whatever our banks tell us to go into as opposed yeah, to really... go to the banks or they or, or people go for low fees you know yeah. and interestingly you know um, 
I mean, I'd rather pay bigger fees and get better better returns because it's about bottom line, right? You yep. know, it's not about what you pay. It's about what you get mm-hmm. at the end of the day. What's your net return? So, yep. yeah, so it's definitely a an area that's got a lot of growth for us. Excellent. We'll come back to that in a moment. I want to go back a little step there because you actually said um, that you think the reason you got the highest multiplier ever was because the way the business is set up. So tell us a little bit about how it was set up and yeah, why well, you believe that was. Well, I guess for me, sometimes I think I'm inherently lazy and a lot of my friends would laugh when I say that because because I've been a, a serious workaholic in my life yeah. uh, and don't typically sit still. Well, I'm a little bit better at it these days. But So therefore, when I started the business, it was all about how do you systemize it? Mm-hmm. How do you make things efficient? So I think we had very, I had very good IT systems right from day one, where back then a lot of people were still running le- legacy systems, a lot of paper stuff, yep. whereas I did everything with IT right from day one. I actually built a, uh, a bit of a profile, and that was the other thing that was quite interesting because – it kind of happened by accident, and that was when I wrote my first book that spent six months on the bestseller list. Wow. And um, So which, when you said by accident, what happened? Well, because I had a friend of mine who uh, we were both involved in the Property Investors Association in Auckland, and he was the president and I was the vice president. And in my role as a financial advisor, and he had a little magazine then, which was the precursor to the New Zealand Property Investors magazine. Oh, yep. And he, both of us get people you know, come to us and say, well, how do we invest in property? And I got really bored having to repeat myself, basically. <laughs> and so I said, well, why don't we put this guide together? So, I, you know, because it made sense to me because then, you know, systemize it. People come in. Here's a little plan. Yep. Here's, here's who you need to talk to. And then I can kind of crunch everything down into sort of an hour or so. And then I talked, rung him up and said, look, I think you should do this because people are always ringing you up for free advice, you know, as the editor of the magazine. So we actually put this book together, basically. Well, we actually, it's not quite right. We put it as a guide for to send to people who called us. And then I had an epiphany one day and I sat down and thought, Oh, maybe we can publish it. How do you publish a book? I don't know. So I thought, I remember Penguin, you know, from probably some, <laughs> I don't know, Millers and Boons I used to read or something, you know. And so anyway, I opened up the yellow pages back then yep. and went, Penguin. So I rang up and said, oh, can I talk to the person who publishes books and told them about our book? And they were actually quite interested and but then they said no and I was like oh, I was really bummed out um, and then about a month later I thought I'll oh, bugger it all so I went to the other pages again and wrote, made about a half a dozen calls and ended up with a contract with um, both Random House and Reed mm. um, to publish our book and so um, that's how the book started and when that came out we had a huge amount of publicity yeah so suddenly I found myself on all the TV shows and you know hundreds of radio shows and we got we got a huge amount of press yeah and I, I guess- think when I first met you I remember so I'd seen you in the Herald, I'd heard you on the radio, like everywhere you turned, Lisa Dunstan was talking about finances. Yeah, yeah. well, that's right, because I think of one year, I'm back, you know, I was having something like 56 appearances in the, or uh, mentions in the Herald, and that's just one newspaper yep. in one year. Um, so I was doing a lot of media, and I think it possibly was because I was a young, chatty female. Mm-hmm. Uh, and funnily enough, I just talked to a reporter that I knew back in those days just recently, and he said, that's it. You, you were lively. You were easy to talk to. You know, I had all the qualifications to back it up. Yeah. You know, because at that time, most of the industry were kind of old men. Mm-hmm. You know, the average age was in their mid-50s. They were a little bit boring, a little bit staged. Yeah. Whereas I just, you know, chat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's changed there, which is great. No. <laughs> Mind you, I don't have to be more careful these days in the world we live in blooming compliance. Oh, but, yes. You know, it's yeah. just like bleak, bleak, yeah. bleak. You can't say that. <laughs> so that first book, what was that book called? Um, it was a bit of a mouthful, The New Zealand Residential Guide to Property Investment. Okay. And so it became a bestseller. You it became did. sort of well-known throughout the different media and whatnot. What impact did that have on the business? Well, it meant that I was – we had quite a lot of profile in the, in the business. So, you know, because I think it's – it's not so much that people um, rung you up from the radio station, but when they kind of found you when they're searching for financial advice, they got, oh, she's written books, she's been on the radio, she's been on TV, she must know what she's talking about. Yeah. So I think it was, the, it was credibility marketing yeah. because, you know, I was a young female in a very male-dominated industry and um, – you know, like I said, in the early days, um, 3% of the financial services industry were female yep. back when I started. And, you know, I, one of the challenges I had was people treating me like their secretary, you right. know, like, and talking to me like a complete freaking moron. <laughs> and, you know, and I've got some interesting stories, you know, of experiences I've had with guys treating me like that, you yep. know. And so you just have to get a little bit bolshy and, and um, you know, I had been called a media queen and, you know, which was interesting at times, but <laughs> yep. I think jealousy maybe. But, <laughs> but anyway, I think it just, 
just it, it gave it was very very good for credibility marketing but it did take a lot of time yeah okay yeah. i'm interested though because often what happens when you build a business around your own name particularly and you become the star of the media um it's then difficult to actually build the business because everybody wants to deal with you but you actually had 11 staff so how did you go from you know lisa being the the one that's known and seen to scaling it to have other people well, I think we scaled it because we had we had a range of different divisions. So we like we did. Um, I did the investment advice. John did the insurance. We had another someone else doing insurance. I had a fantastic PA yep. um, who kind of just screened everything. When you know <laughs> I'd written something in the paper and someone had just rang up wanting to chat about the economy, yep. that would all be screened. So I just had very good support people around me, and I. I I worked some serious hours, like, yeah. you know, 70, 80, 90 hour weeks, you know, I didn't get a lot of free time for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, possibly what led us to selling too. I was probably a bit tired. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What would you do differently if you had to do, if you could do it all over again? Well, it's interesting actually, because, you know, I, I think it was great because you learn a lot. Like, because back then, you know, I was probably in my late twenties when we started that business and, and, and John joined me and, you know, we were young and we were a little bit naive and we just, you know, you have a lot of capacity to take on a lot of work. Yep. So we worked really, really hard and we kind of said, there was an opportunity said, yeah, yeah, let's we'll, we'll just give that a whirl. And interestingly, you know, when we looked at it years down the track, we probably could have made more money being smarter, yep. but we wouldn't have had those experiences. And those experiences of what's carried through into other businesses mm. um, and, you know, it's the learnings. And it also carries through to when I'm talking to my clients, all those learnings that I've had. Yeah. Whereas if I, you know, so I think it's just, you know, I, you know, it was fun. It was hard work. But I think you've got to be careful as a business owner because you can get, if you get burnt out, yeah. you know, your body gets burnt out, you get sick, your brain gets fuzzy and you make dumb decisions, yeah, I can you know. Completely relate to that. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. Think, I think a lot of business people, because yep. you go into business because you think, I, I want to have more freedom, mm -hmm. you know, I want to potentially work less, I want to be my own boss and do what I want to do and I want to get better rewards. But the reality is, in the first few years for most business owners, That's you work a lot more hours, you earn a lot less, you mm -hmm. have a lot more stress and you sit there and you think, what the hell? <laughs> um, but And I think there was a bit of that with us, but I learned from that yeah. and I think that was the, most important thing and you still made a good decision because you actually built it up to a reasonable size you sold to somebody who obviously paid the value that was worth and so it was a good sort of um, exit for you yeah and I think and, and but when we sold it we sold the client basis so okay. that's the other thing that's a little bit different so um and because they didn't necessarily take me with them, mm -hmm. which was interesting yep. because I really wanted, at that point in time, I was thinking I wanted to get out of the industry because yep. I was a bit, you know, I think we we're tired. And so they just took the client basis. So then, then picking that up and because they were so well looked after and well managed with great records, they could just plug them into their business right so that that essentially meant that profit went straight on their bottom line which mm. is why we got a high multiplier okay. and yeah. that comes back to the systems and processes having good yeah. it systems right yeah and the way i manage the, the handover yeah. too of you know between one business and the other so we didn't cover this off but i know that you've had property yourself for a long long time right when did you have your first property uh, about 22, I think it is. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. now you've got a, a portfolio yeah. of properties. Yeah. So once you sold the business, I mean, that would be quite challenging, right? Because you've been doing this for X number of years. It's your whole life. You're working these hours. What happened? Um, well, I did a bit of soul searching as you do. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, I think, oh, do I want to take up this activity or that activity? And, and I kind of thought, yeah, nothing really appealed to me. And I, I still did a couple of, a little bit of one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one consultations because that's what I specialise in. People yeah. pay me an hourly rate and I sit down with them and go, this is what we think, what you should be doing. Yeah. And so I was still doing a little bit of that and I was still writing. I was actually, I um, used to write a lot for Yahoo and for the Women's Weekly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I was probably writing half a dozen articles a month. So, you know, I was kind of doing a bit of part-time work. Yeah. Um, but I just took a couple of years off to actually really think about what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, took a three-month trip around the world um, to sort of um, Central America, which was great. Yep. Um, and I think what was interesting I learned back then, it was like – I really love the industry. I think I just got tired. Yeah. Right. So I love the industry. I really get a, a huge buzz from actually helping people move ahead mm. financially um, and helping them have better choices in their life. So that was a sort of a given for me. But I didn't want to go back into having responsibility for staff and offices. I wanted to be able to work from home. So I guess I, I sat down and said, okay, well, I want to work in the industry. Yep. I still want to do certain things. I want to work from home. These are the parameters or the boundaries that I decided I needed in my life. And mm -hmm. then I went, okay, how do I rebuild acumen? Yep. 
uh, because I didn't sell the brand, how do I rebuild that business taking into account those parameters? And that's essentially what I've done until today. Okay. And so now with Acumen, I know that you work, as you said, uh, with people on a one-on-one basis and you're a little bit different to a lot of advisors who might specialize in a particular area. You really are quite holistic in terms of your approach and tell us a little bit about how that actually works with the client. Yeah, because most financial advisors are quite product orientated. So they're either they're mortgage advisors, they're insurance advisors, or they're investment advisors and there's product around that. I don't deal with any product as such. Yeah. So I sit down with people, fill out a questionnaire. I kind of go, well, where are you now? Where do you want to be? you know, what have we got to work with? What resources? So most of um, financial advisors will look at what money have we got to work with? Whereas I look at what money have you got, what lump sum, what kind of income have you, or spare income have you got, or how do we get more spare income? I look at what your skills um, and your personality is. I look at how active or passive you want to be. I kind of trying to dig inside your psyche a bit more (laughs) to go, right, here are the resources. This is where you want to be. How do we get you from A to B? Mm -hmm. These are the various options. And then I kind of watch closely with people because I found it really interesting. You know, when I say certain things, people was like... (sighs) They feel very flat or they conversely, they do the opposite and they suddenly get very engaged and very excited. And so I try to ferret around and go, what makes sense for this individual? So I think that's why I'm different. I've got that holistic experience Mm -hmm. um, because I'm getting paid on an hourly rate basis. I'm not selling product and I'm just really trying to get a result for people really. And so I kind of call myself a financial sounding board. Yeah. And I think that's actually really key because I think that it's a little bit like business, right? If you're not doing what you love, then you won't get the results you actually want. So the same with an investment. I mean, different investment strategies can produce similar returns, but um, you really have to be bought into what it is you're Oh yeah. Because I mean, you know, I mean, one of the things that people have to do is be more mindful about how they spend the money. It's yep. not, it's really not rocket science, right? You just <laughs> spend less than you earn and you try it. The bigger gap you can get and the longer you invest it, the better off you're going to be. Not rocket science. Would sure. you get that into one whole sentence, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, but it's easier said than done. And, yeah. you know, it's the same thing I always say to you know, my clients. If you want to lose weight, you know, you can live on chicken breasts and bloody broccoli. steamed broccoli and protein yep. powder and you'll strip right down to bodybuilding stage in a couple of months, right? Yeah. But the realities of trying to put that into practice, unless you're really, really motivated, is yeah. tough. Right, so that's why. So it's always a negotiation process with my clients going, Well, what can we work with? What's going to be practical? And it's better for you to make a small step Mm -hmm. than what it is to actually try and take on board a whole bunch of stuff and then fall on your face. Yeah. And it's kind of that whole want versus commitment, right? You can say you want to lose weight, but you actually have to be committed to it. And yeah. in order to be committed to it, it has to be something that actually works for you. Oh, yeah. Look, I've had a client recently that I've just helped buy a property because I have a service where I um, work with people to buy a property investment for them. So we kind of tidy all their finances up, um, get them into a bit of a plan, and I go and find them an actual property. Yeah. And um, I've been working with this person for about 15 years, and oh, my God, money. Diabolical with money. And we've had lots <laughs> well, of conversations. Like, oh yeah, she's, oh, she's an absolute freaking shocker. Yeah. And anyway, we finally got to the point last year where she'd actually paid off all her debts and yep. a lot of debts, and um, and we we got into her first rental property, and that was a huge buzz yep. for as much for for her and her husband as it was for me. Yeah. You know, oh, after nice. all of those years, you know, so that's that's nice. And a lot of my clients I have worked with for a very long period of time because again, if you've if you've got a good solid financial um, platform yep. um, yeah, life is easier a lot of stress is created around money yeah and specifically for business owners as we obviously we've got business owners yeah. listening in here um, a lot of people pump everything into their business yep. you know I've been there done that got the t-shirt yep. um, which is a bit of a dangerous strategy isn't it because what happens if that business doesn't quite work out the way you planned it to yeah well that's right and and if you look at the stats you know most cases it doesn't work out the way you plan it to be right yep. because a lot of business owners Nirvana is getting to the point where you get the check or it's not really a check these days but you know with enough zeros on it to kind of plan and have a comfortable retirement yeah but it doesn't often work out and so I tend to I tend to believe very strongly in multiple streams of income yeah so I go well let's get yourself into Kiwi Saver even it's the minimum of a thousand dollars you know a thousand forty two a year to get the government contribution let's save a couple hundred dollars a month let's get your mortgage paid off a bit faster you know yeah. just a whole range of little things that you know that over time it may not seem a lot at the moment but over time it does mean a lot Um, but the argument with a lot of business owners is they go oh well I can get a better return on my money Mm -hmm. putting that into my business and I go maybe but not most people yep so I go let's just be safe Mm -hmm. and have some other strategies as a backup yeah so what's the biggest mistake that you see business people kind of making with their investments um 
Well, probably not doing many. Yep. Uh, or or their um, main investment is their business. I think yep. that's that's the main thing. And, and I guess, you know, just because you earn a dollar doesn't necessarily mean you get to spend a dollar in a business, right? Because yep. I think a lot of business owners don't pay enough attention to their um, profit and loss. Yep. You know, you earn a dollar, you got to pay tax, you got to pay, you got all your expenses, and just that some and that merging often with smaller businesses between their business income and their personal income, yep. it's all just mushed together. Yep. So I think it's really important, and whether you're talking about your business finances or your personal finances, to actually have that awareness. Because mm-hmm. if you've got awareness, you make different choices. Yeah. You know, a lot of people just want to bury their head in the sand, hoping for the big payday one day. Yeah. And I think that can be a bit of a mistake. Fair enough. Tell us a little bit about Saturn, because how did you get involved with Saturn and, and what is your role there? Well, interesting, Saturn in its, in its previous version was was actually the company that bought Acumen's client, oh, base, client base, right? Oh, okay. So then I stayed on as a director. Mm-hmm. And then um, a couple of years down the track, um, we brought back in John, who's my previous business partner in Acumen, into Saturn, and he's now the managing director. Yep. And so we just well, mainly more him, um, turned that business around and we've grown it to the point where we are today. So now I'm the second largest shareholder in that business. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we're um, about half a billion dollars of funds under management and, you know, so about 27 in our team. And yep. we've got a couple of thousand KiwiSaver clients and we, we just bought that business about uh, just on two years ago now. Mm-hmm. So I think that's got a huge amount of um, potential. So I work in that business, you know, I guess as a director shareholder role about a day a week. Yeah, uh, which is great because then I don't have the personal responsibility of staff because that's a challenge <laughs> and a half these days. Yep, um, I get to be involved in all the business stuff which I love, and yep. then I've got to work with my clients as well. So it's a nice combination for me. And that's what we call like the US life. You're actually doing the stuff that makes your heart sing. Your yep. your why for your reason for existing. You're actually doing that while still having time to do the other things that are important to you. Too. Yeah, well that's right, and that's right. and it's, sometimes it's hard because I I find it it's not easy finding this blooming word balance, right? Yep. You know, because I actually really enjoy business. Yep. So it really does make my heart sing and it gets me really energized but I also have to be careful not to get too burnt out and some of the things that I've done for a number of years is I actually put all my gym appointments into my diary Mm -hmm. for the year yeah they're like reoccurring appointments and so I only work um, Monday to Thursday I start at 10 yeah even though I do a bit of work beforehand from a client's perspective you know it's 10 um, it's 10 to 5 Monday to Thursday and Friday I I do what I want to do and work comes in and out of all of those times around that as well but I just try to contain it yeah um And I think the other thing that I've learned too is about being really, really clear about what's important to you Mm. because you can get really distracted. Um, And one of the things I mentioned before is that um, when you start getting a bit of a profile and you get known in your industry, people are always coming to you because they want to be part of your success and they want to have all these opportunities for you to look at. Yeah. And, excuse me. And you can kind of get all, go all over the place. So what I did is I created that sort of filtering system to say, this is who I am as a person. So I've yep. done a lot of personality profiles. Mm-hmm. This is what's important to me. And then I try to put sort of um, any opportunities through that filtering process to see whether it's worth me investing time into it. And I actually just recommend that with uh, our business owners as well. Even in, in you know medium-sized businesses, you actually want to work with people you love. Yep. And if you're not working with people you love, then it's not a great place to be. And so it's, there's nothing wrong with saying no to clients that do not meet your yep. ideal client criteria. Well, that's right. A lot of people have trouble tr- tr- um, trying to say no. And I don't know, for some of my clients, what I've done is I've told them, you know those little coloured sticky, round sticky um, things like yeah, they flourish. Little dots. Yeah, little dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've got the, uh, people to put the word no in it. <laughs> yes. And then put it on their computer screen and on their steering wheel on their fridge. And uh, fridge might be quite good if you tend to be in there with the chocolate biscuits. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and, and to, to learn to say no and to understand that, you know, it's safe to say no. Yeah. Um, because I think saying no is probably more important in many ways than saying yes. Mm-hmm. But I think you have to get clear about you know, who you are as a person. Like, I yeah. know what I'm good at and I know what I suck at. Yes. Um, you know, and some of that's been trial and error and some of that's through a lot of the personality profiling that I've done over the years. And because I know that and I know what gives me energy, um, you know, and you like to say, I don't like working with dicks. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> I have said to some clients in the past, you're not for me. I'm not for you. I yeah. tend to turn around that way mm-hmm. uh, because I think, oh my God, this is going to be freaking hard work. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, Gino, who invented EOS, he sort of talks about the fact that actually the, the more you say no to the better it is for you. Mm. But also we tend to want to o- to over explain or explain why we yeah. said no. Yeah. And he said, actually, the best way you can actually do it is just 
no no or no thank you yeah, yeah yeah don't bother getting into any of the bits around it no, no. thank you that's not for me that's yeah it. that's right because if you do you get into this dialogue and then yeah. you get into that whole sales thing people go oh well what about this yeah, and what about that, that and angle, yeah, that's right, yeah. Like, yeah. i mean look totally agree it's yep. really really and it's healthy and that's the thing as an entrepreneur is you've got to keep coming back to how do you be healthy mm. how do you be healthy mentally be phys- physically healthy and both yep. of those things are as important as one another so you know we have to take care for ourselves and i one thing i think that also i learned is that if I keep giving to other people, I can't give to the people I really care about because mm. there's nothing left in the tank. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, I, I've certainly been guilty of this when I was younger. You know, you want to be, you want to help so many people that you literally go out there and try and help everybody. Yep. Um, but as you said, you actually run out of any kind of fuel in the tank to give to the people that um, are important. And so yeah. it's better to actually conserve that energy and yeah. use it in a really wise way well yeah. that's right and you, I mean you're an incredibly generous person you know mm. and it's and it's hard because you know you feel for people and I remember the early days of my career I'd go home and I'd have sleepless nights I'd be like oh my god you know take I'm, on board everybody else's yeah, worry yeah <laughs> I know I, was, I used to get so stressed and worry about you know everyone else's financial position and yep. what it all meant for them and then I just had to learn that this is going to put me into an early grave yeah. you yeah. know I just have to learn to you know I'm incredibly present with my clients but mm-hmm. I try to let it go um, when, when I when I go it. home, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I do like the idea, and I've talked about this before. Putting things into your calendar, the things that are really important. Mm. So we have rocks in business; they're the important pieces of work you need to do every ninety days to ensure you're going forward on your on your vision. Um, but then I think in your personal life, putting those rocks in and saying it's non negotiable. I do the same. I've got my three gym appointments mm. in every single week, and they're there, uh, mm. which means I know not to do anything else in that time. I make time to do the other things I want to do, so I actually do get to go on a date night or mm. get to go and do some things on the weekend. So yeah, well, you be smart, like we. You and I, where we, where we catch up and go for a yeah. walk and we have a chat about business and we have a chat about what's happening in our lives. And so, yeah. you know, that's kind of multi, you know. Um, Not quite multitasking, yeah, but yeah, but, but, you know, but making you special yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. And sometimes, you know, when like, you sit, stare at your computer screen, you think, oh, crocker, this is all hard work. You yeah. know, pick yourself up and go for a walk. Yeah. You know, I often save my phone calls um, for when I'm walking. You know, because, nice. it, again, it fills in some time, but it also makes me, I feel that I can actually do something constructive while I'm out walking as well. Mm-hmm. So it gives me, you know, a bit of a break and some fresh air. And, yep. and hopefully it says to some of the people that I'm talking to for them to get out and get some fresh air as well. I love walk and talk. It's really, really important. Now, I know that you have, um, we've already talked about some of the things, but you've got three kind of top tips, if you like, that you really want people oh, to yes, have a, yes, yes. a look at. So let's have a bit of a discussion around recap. those. Yeah, I guess the first one is to get really clear about what you're good at and what you're bound are so yep. therefore um you it makes it easier for you to say no yes. um, to take on you know so you can take on the right opportunities and mm-hmm. i think being clear about your boundaries is really really important yeah you know what are the things that are important to you it's like for me i was saying you know i want to mainly work from home yeah. i only i want, want to work with a small client base you know for, for, with acumen i only want to keep it for me i don't want to take on any staff mm-hmm. um you know i've got a few outsources that do a few you know specific things so you know i'm just i'm clear about that now and yep. it just makes things a lot easier um, the second thing was, you know, developing that filtering system. Yes. So when an opportunity comes to you, how does it work? You know, um, I was talking to someone the other day about they were looking at something and I'm like, but that's a, there's a huge amount of lead time to take that opportunity on board. There's a lot of cost and time and money. Mm-hmm. Does that fit your business model? Yeah. Like it may be great to pull something like that, that off, but how hard is it to pull it off? How does it fit back in to, you know, how, you're, how you want to grow your business? Because mm. it's very easy to get distracted. When yes. you're in business, right? <laughs> yep. Particularly when yep. things aren't going quite so well, you go, oh, well, I'll just try this and I'll try that and I'll try something else. So just keep coming back to what are the things that are important to you. Exactly. Um, and, then the, and then from a uh, creating a good wealth base so you've got more freedom of choice is to start saving sooner rather than later. Yep. Like, you know, just little things. Like if you just paid off $100 or a couple hundred dollars a month off your mortgage extra, yep. you put a couple hundred dollars into maybe like a, a share um, scheme. Yep. So, you know, that, um, that it built over time and, and that's liquid too. So if you got a, into a tough time with your business, you can, not, actually, you can actually get it, you know, make sure you're in KiwiSaver. Yeah. You know, when you can afford it, get into a property, leverage yourself into a property investment, just keep pottering away at these things over time. And you'll know, you know, notice that, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the track, you'd be amazed at what you can 
build alongside your business Mm. just in case your business doesn't go according to plan and I think it's one of the important things about working with the financial advisors you know sometimes when we actually go through and we look at what we're really spending money on there are some little things that don't make a huge difference to your life if you actually got rid of them they can make a massive difference with that cumulative effect over time oh yeah particularly these days because everyone wants a license fee yeah you know so (laughs) you know a friend of mine said oh she was in a a bit of a tough financial time and she said oh I've gone through everything and then about a year later she said to me oh I went through all my subscriptions and I saved two thousand dollars a year you know it's there's lots of little things that add up and, it, and it's about you know I remember going one day and I'd taken up gardening and um, went and bought some gardening magazines and I walked up to the counter and it was $40 and I remember having heart failure thinking $40 for gardening magazines because I could have bought them I could have got them from the library yeah or looked at it on the internet mm. you know so it's just because I like to travel so I like to save all my money for you know I spend a hell of a lot of money on travel <laughs> yes. um so and food I like to entertain quite a lot as well yes. so yeah. um yeah so you just got to think about what's valuable for you You know you only get to spend your dollars once, once. so you want to yep. make sure that it's you spend those hard-earned dollars really really you know um uh, really really well and so you get the most value out of those out of that money because one of my favorite saying is, is what's the difference between why, the way a millionaire spends their money and the average person spends their money the millionaire millionaire spends one minute longer thinking about the buying decision uh, do I really want it do I really need it can I get better value somewhere else and I yeah. think when I look back on it that's the strategy that I've had since I was young because you know when you're starting out you don't have a lot of money yeah and travel was important to me so I've always been quite careful with my money because that's where my money always goes mm. Because the travel is more valuable than yep. having a whole bunch of stuff. And so really, it is just about at the time, point of purchase, if you like, yep. just asking yourself quite honestly, do I really need it? Yep. Do, is it really going to help me in where I'm going? Yep. And is it something that has better value for me than this? That's right, because yep. we spend a lot of money on a lot oh, of shit. Lot, and, and I just say, <laughs> being, a, being a bright, shiny object girl and a bit of a tech gadget as well, um, my software and app subscriptions. Yeah. So you just start awesome. looking at things that you use on the phone and you think, you know, you go, oh, I'm only paying twenty nine ninety nine. I'm yep. only paying $50 a year for it but nevertheless you know you only have to have 10 apps at $50 a year yep. that's $500 and if you're not using it, it's not any real value to you well here's an example for you so yep. my um partner he had a guy working for him and he was got himself a bit of financial pickle at 21 anyway it was a bit of a mess yep. and he was a bit despondent about the same thing about, about it and so he was I knew that he was, he was a smoker and I knew he was trying to give up and yep. so I, I worked out that he smoked three packets of cigarettes a week so at that time it was about 60 bucks so I worked out that if he put $60 a, um, a week into a balanced um, investment fund yep. until the time he got to the age of 65 he had about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow yeah so that's <laughs> a really good example of it's only 20 bucks it's only ten dollars yep. yeah and i think software and apps is one of the ones that like, quite often there's a real low-hanging fruit there in terms yeah. of are you actually really using that i mean it's different if it saves you time if it saves you uh, money but re- in reality a lot of these things are just a, there's a bright lot, shiny object yeah there's a lot of bright <laughs> shiny ob- objects out there and there's a lot of money being spent on marketing to help us um um, connect and buy those bright shiny objects <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so hey look we could probably talk all day we often do um, but we're coming to the end of this sort of show so just tell us a little bit about you know your your business and, and the type of clients you love to work with and I also know that you have got so sitting there right in front of us a new book coming out oh, yes, as well yes I just got this about two days ago so this is these cameras and there yeah there's a so, camera yeah yep, okay so good this, with money good with money so this is um I wrote this a couple of months ago and this is coming out in April yep so I think this is I don't know about 10th book I think so I'm quite excited it's just a really good basic you know how do you be smart with your money it's got some case studies all the way through yeah um so i think the, that's a really important part this is actually sharing with you how other people have actually yeah it was kind of cool because i went out to my um database my, my newsletter and said look hey i'm writing this book and like if anyone's got a story to share and i got all these responses so yep. it's awesome so these are all real life what's happened and some of the people have written sort of over 20 years of how they've progressed and so it's, it's seriously cool yep. um so the type of people that i like to work with a lot of my clients are professional people or business owners and yep. they are typically 40 to probably 55 who go hey retirement is kind of getting closer we don't have much in the way of investment strategy we need yep. to be more attentive about our finances so I kind of they're the type of people they work with and say let's just get a bit of a plan of attack together and some of those I go and help buy investment properties for as well yeah so um, yeah so I just have a small client base that I work quite closely with now I know I asked you this question when we had dinner the other day but I'm going to ask it on the podcast as well so property is taking a bit of a, a dive at the moment if you believe everything you read in the media um, and I asked the question of you like you know is this is this a worrying will it go backwards what, what are your views on that um, well you know I talked to a lot of people about this and look you, know, you just have to look back from graphs for the last hundred years and they go up and all oh, investments go 
go up and they go down. And at the moment, everything's down and we're yep. coming into a bit of a challenging time. And um, and I would seriously recommend that you don't believe everything you read in the media. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I think we've got we've got a tough six months ahead of us in yep. sort of all investment spaces. But, you know, there's some great deals out there at the, in the properties market right now, yep. right? So, um, you know, and that's when, even for a lot of businesses, you know, there's, there's new businesses being that will be launched this year that are incredibly successful because they've seen opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I, I always think that it comes back to, you've got to come back to who who you are, what are you trying to achieve, what makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. You consider what's going on in the markets right now, but you can't change it. Yeah. You know, if it means, you know, getting into a property now, but it might not grow in value for another year or two, so be it. Yeah. At it's least you've made a decision. Yeah. You've, because otherwise what I've found is lots of people spend years and years and years going, it's never the right time. Yeah. So, you know, I guess the moral of that story is get some advice. Well, and yeah. get a plan in place. It's, it's yeah. not much like your business. Yeah. I mean, all of my clients I've been yeah. working with, even though we've, we're starting to go through this sort of downturn, they're still overachieving and achieving their targets because they've got a plan. Yeah. They know what they need to do and they stick to that plan. Yeah. They don't get distracted by the media, by the talk of recession. Just go, actually, we know we have a good business. We know we have the right kind of um, customers we're working with. We know the value we deliver. Mm. We charge the appropriate price and we're going to hit our targets. Well, and I guess that's the value for working for people like you and I, right? because we help people focus on what are the things that are actually important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and get rid of all the noise that's around the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because some of my clients are going, "Oh, my friends are saying you got rocks in your head," and I'm like, "Well, when is the right time?" Yeah. You know, and if we, we think, look at after COVID, for instance, everyone was in an absolute panic about COVID, yep. and then next thing you know, the house prices went up fifty percent in the next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and to be fair, I mean, I know that the, the media wants to work recession, and I, I appreciate we will definitely go through a, a period of non growth, if you like. Yep. But people are still spending money, and there is still money out there. Yeah. Um, without a doubt. So there might be some people going through a tough time. I believe those who are going through a tough time probably didn't have the right plan in the first place. Um, those who've got a plan and are following it will actually come out the other side way better off. Well, and I think that's what I try to do, and I know you do the same thing, is, is how do we kind of cover all those things? You know, how do we get you in a place where you've got good financial foundations? How do mm -hmm. we get you educated so you understand why you do what you do with your money? Yeah. You know, because if you get that in place, the cumulative effect down the track is, can be quite extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if somebody wants to come and work with you, Lisa, how do they get hold? of you um they probably best things go to my website which is um, acumen.co.nz yep. nice and simple and um yeah otherwise my contact details are on there so just just email me give me a bell and um yeah i'd love to talk to you put you through the filter first though hey? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well just, you know i mean at least someone's a complete dick you yeah, know yeah. i mean you know <laughs> Yeah, and most people aren't. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Excellent. And that book, again, is Good With Money, and we'll put a link um, on the, the website as well. So thank you so much for your time. Um, You're welcome. Thanks for having speak, me here. Well, oh, it's good to speak to you actually in a more formal environment than we usually do. But, yeah, thank you for coming in. We we'll look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks, Deborah.